Well, good morning again. Thank you so much for gathering here this morning. Thank you for bringing the church into this space here this morning. If you're gathered with us for Cross Point at Home, thanks for bringing the church into your living room or your dining room, wherever you happen to be participating. And if we've never met before, my name is Jamie. It's my joy and privilege to be one of the pastors here at Cross Point. Uh, It's my joy to open up God's word. Uh, It has been an absolute joy to worship with you all already this morning, to go before the Lord as we sing songs, as we joined in, in prayer. I don't know about you, but like my heart needed that to sing those truths, to be reminded. Um, In fact, I was like, can we just keep going with with that? They don't need to listen to me. But here's the reality. You do need to hear from God's word. You don't need my thoughts or opinions, but we do get the privilege of opening God's word. And my hope and prayer that this too would just be an act of worship, that we would surrender everything to him. And as we journey through the book of John together over the better part of 2021 and this series that we've called Come and See, that we would heed that invitation. Maybe some for the very first time, but regardless of where you're at in your walk with Christ, that we would, we would come and we would hear from him and that we would see him and that we would find it would be just so glorious that whatever we dragged in here this morning, the pain, the hurt, the, the celebrations, the frustrations, whatever it happens to be, that God is with us, that he is near us. And as we're going to look at specifically in our text this morning, that Jesus has not abandoned us, that even though he ascended, he has sent the spirit to be with us. And that spirit is alive and working right here, right now. All right, so let's be encouraged in that. And so I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 15. If you brought a Bible, we're going to end John chapter 15, look at the last few verses, and then into chapter 16. And again, go to cplife.church on your phone. If you'd like to follow along, you'll see a, a, a spot you can click that says sermon notes, um, or message notes, and you can follow along. The text will be there as well as anything that gets put up on the slides this morning. There's space to take notes. You can email them to yourself afterwards. Um, it's a good way to just kind of revisit some of these themes because this is not the end of the day. Maybe you'll learn something. That would be great, but this is not about taking in information. We are asking the Spirit, not just when we leave here, but like right here, right now, in this moment, to bring about transformation. That's what you need. That's what I need. And God promises that he is at work. And so let's trust him in that. But I want to go ahead and read this text and then we'll make our way back through it. So John chapter 15, there's a fair amount here. And I will come back if you missed last week and if you're just picking us picking up with this, you know, kind of maybe this is your first time. You've only been here a couple of times. Um, I'll give you some background in just a moment. So no, no worries about any of that. But In verse 18, Jesus begins to tell his disciples and to tell us what to expect as followers of him. And so John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18, says this. If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. So if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But they will will do all these things to you on account of my name because they don't know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now they have no excuse for their sin. The one who hates me also hates my father. If I had not done the works among them that no one else has done, they would not have sinned. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But this happened so that the statement written in their law might be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. And when the counselor comes, the one I will send you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify about me. You also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Now into chapter 16, verse one, I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from the synagogues. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But I have told you these things that when their time comes, you will remember I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going away to him who sent me. And not one of you asks me, where are you going? Yet because I've spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment, 
because the ruler of this world has been judged. Verse 12, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. And everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. This is God's word for us this morning. And so what I want to do is look at this because Jesus is, we have to remember the context here. He is in the final days. He is literally just a few days away from his upcoming death, his impending death. I mean, literally what this is setting up for is like we're the weekend, the weekend is just over the horizon. Like the weekend is about to happen and Jesus is giving these words now, you imagine for a moment, like if you're nearing your death, if you knew when that time w- was coming, the things that you would be talking about would not be the trivial things. My guess is you're not talking about the weather, all right? You're not talking about just insignificant things. You're probably not like, oh my gosh, my Amazon order was delayed again, right? Like you're not doing that. The reality is, is what you would be communicating is love and care and compassion. You'd be wanting to have significant and weighty conversations. And this is the reality for Jesus. He's looking ahead and he's gathering his disciples, but not only the disciples back then, he's speaking to us here in this moment to say, my friend, here's what it looks like to be engaged and connected to me and to my mission. So what I want to look at this morning is a quick recap of where we were last week to look at the mission that God has for us And then this mission will bring about opposition. So there's the mission, the opposition, and what does God do in light of this opposition? What is his provision for us? And so if you were here last week, you know that we looked at the first part of John 15 where Jesus makes this declaration. John 15, 5, just a reminder of the mission that God has given to us. Jesus said this, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. So the call for us as the church are to be a fruitful people. At one hand, like on the the character side of it, that we would be growing in the fruit of the Spirit. That we would be so connected to Jesus as the vine, the source of life, that we are the branches, and that we would begin to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All the things I'm sure you perfectly embodied in this past week, as did I, right? No, like the reality is like, oh my goodness, like we need God's mercy and grace. Additionally, that we would be disciples who make disciples, that we would be faithful to proclaim the hope that we have, even in the midst of trials and difficulty and suffering, and that we would see more people get connected to the vine. This is the mission that God has given to us. And Jesus, in his love for us, his care for us, as well as the disciples a couple thousand years ago, and for everyone that has followed him since and will in the future, in love, he gives us some very difficult words. Like, if you're hoping this morning, like, all right, come in, like, what's this kind of cheery text, right? Basically, you just heard, welcome to church. Hey, the world hated me, and the world's gonna hate you, so welcome. Like, that's what Jesus is laying out before his disciples and for those that would follow after him. And so on its own, if we just stop there, it could be very discouraging, but that's not where it stops, that Jesus begins to share with his disciples what it looks like to face that opposition. So we're going to look at that for a few moments here, and then we'll talk about the ways that God has given us through the power of the Spirit to engage, that this is not a message of despair, but rather this is just a realistic account of what we will face, and then to see that God is continuing to bring fruit. And if you're like, oh, man, this sounds hard. People are going to hate me, persecution, reviling, maligning, all of that. But guess what? That doesn't have the final say. You know how I know that? You're here this morning, right? The church has continued. Nations have risen and fallen. Kingdoms have come and gone. But Jesus is on his throne. He's ruling and reigning, and he has summoned us. He has called you and I to gather this morning to hear this word on this particular day. So let's look at this opposition. And so if we would look back the end of chapter 15 and then into the first few verses, there's a couple things I think are worth just talking about here. It's not a matter of if suffering, if trials, if persecution is going to come. It really is a matter of when. 
And so one of the things we have to see in this, maybe a way to frame this, is it's inevitable and it's also intense. So he's saying, hey, the world is going to hate you, right? You're a servant, you're not above your master, and if this is what has happened to me, this will happen to you. And the intensity is seen at the beginning of chapter 16. He's like, I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. Jesus wants to keep us on the path, following after him. And then he says this, they will ban you from the synagogue, which to us, we might be like, well, that's not that big of a deal. Unless you were a Jew in that time, in that place, the synagogue was everything. That was the community center. That's where people hung out. That's where the relationships were. And this is saying a time is coming where you will be cut off from the people that you've been in deep relationship with, the people you grew up with, your friends, the people you went to school with, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your nieces and your nephews, your brothers and sisters, your mom and dad. You're going to be cast out of that. This is going to divide families. And some of you feel that. Some of you are that weird Christian in your family. You're viewed weird by everybody else, right? Where everybody else is excited about Thanksgiving rolling around. Maybe you're like, oh, if the conversation goes towards religion, again, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so there's this divisive sort of nature to it. And there's an intensity. I mean, it even says this. They will do these things, all right? It says back in verse 2, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will actually think that he's offering service to God. We have to look no further than the Apostle Paul, who was Saul at the time. This is what he was doing. And if you had asked him while he was traveling on the road to Damascus what he was going to do to go arrest Christians, to see them put to death, he would have said, I am doing the Lord's work. The Lord is pleased with me. That is until the Lord Jesus met him, knocked him on his backside, blinded him, and made him a Christian, and told him to go and make disciples and to plant churches. But this is how our God works. Even in opposition, know this. Like, this, throughout the story of the scripture, there's opposition to God's purposes. Opposition is brought on by our own hearts. Opposition is brought about by people outside of the church. There is this opposition, but it does not stop the gospel from going forward. This is why Paul would write these things, though, just as, as the reminder, as the encouragement to prepare us, 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Peter picks up on these themes and says this, and look at the language, the intimacy. He's gathering us around. He's like, dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You're blessed when you're reviled. You're blessed when you're persecuted. You're blessed when you follow to the best of your ability the scriptures and other people don't agree with your take. There is a blessing that is here. Now, why does this opposition happen? I think there's a number of things in this text, but it would be helpful for us to kind of zero in. I've got, I think there's three main things in these particular verses that help us understand, hey, okay, why does this sort of thing take place, right? Because it has for a long, long time, right? If you think, sometimes we use the language, oh man, if we could just be back like in the, in the early church, um, okay, that wasn't perfect. There's a lot of things that were wrong. Or if we, go, like, if we just get back to the kind of the beginning, well, we had Genesis 1 and 2, then we had, you turn the page, Genesis 3, and after that, you've got Cain and Abel, you've got a brother killing his brother, right? You've got one that's following God and one that puts the follower of God to death. So from the very beginning, there has been tension, animosity, there has been all of this opposition. Why does that take place? So let's ask that question here for a few moments together. So the first thing I think that we see is we look back over verses 18 to 21 of chapter 5. Again, Jesus reminds us, if the world hates you, know that it's hated me before. And then he says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. And then remember the word that I spoke to you, a servant is not greater than his master. So what we have here is a reminder you are a new person, a new creation. If you have been born again, you have a new identity, you have a new citizenship, you belong to the kingdom of God. All your prior allegiances, 
all right, are out the window. The calling is for you and I to be devoted to him and his purposes and his kingdom. And guess what? He chose you for that. He picked you. He pulled you in. He brought you from death to life. It's all God's work through and through. And so, yes, we might be discouraged with opposition, but know this. The opposition was death. I was dead in my sins and trespasses, and Jesus made me alive. There is no opposition that we will face that can stand in the way of the forward movement of the gospel. And so Jesus says, you've got a new identity, and that will cause division. Not everybody's going to celebrate that. Not everybody's going to think that that's amazing. Because in some ways, to be lost and in the dark, it just sort of welcomes, hey, other people, let's be in this together. There's this new identity. The calling, maybe a way to think about it is this. The calling for us as the church, here's, here's one of my great hopes for us as Crosspoint, is that we would be confusing and bewildering to the culture. Not confusing for confusion's sake, but confusion around the right things. Confusion that would come because people don't know how to categorize you and me in this church collectively together. Because in a world, right, that has all of these sort of partisan nature to it, so on the one hand, we've got more liberal, progressive in a number of areas, including politics, but lots of different ways. And then this conservative, on the other hand, we like to put things in their particular camps. And the gospel frees us to be this radically different people that follows Jesus, follows his word, and in some things that we follow him, it lines up more with one side. In other things, it lines up more with the other. And the calling for us is that we would be unable to be boxed in. Not for our name's sake, but for the the cause of Christ, that there'd be this winsomeness to it. So this past week, I finished a book called After Doubt. I quoted this a few weeks ago by this this, uh, former pastor. He's a professor named A.J. Savoda. And in this, I want to read this quote. He's talking about this call to be this people of God that is oftentimes misunderstood and maligned. And he's advocating for and really saying, You want to know if you're following Jesus faithfully? You will take shots from both sides, probably simultaneously, right? And that should be what we celebrate, that we are so dialed into our new identity that we literally make no sense to either end of the spectrum and people don't know what to do. That's the calling. And if we're not being shot from both sides, we should ask ourselves, what is going on? Is my allegiance more to a political party than it is to the kingdom of God? Svoboda says this. He says, so when I preach the whole kingdom, both sides of God's kingdom must be proclaimed. I must preach Christ's love for the children at the border and the unborn. I have to preach God's call to sexual holiness and God's eternal love for the sexually broken. I have to preach that ecology and human economy matter to God. When we worship Christ, everything matters. And the troubling sign of our times is that I hear little from the mainline progressives that I don't hear also on CNN. And I hear little from the conservative evangelical churches that isn't just some retweet of Fox News. This is not to say that you're not going to have your political preference or vote your conscience or any of that, but can we be honest? There should be something so distinctly different that the various ends of the spectrum do not define us as the people of God. That there would be something so just almost like unnerving or people like, I don't know who you people are. We're like, ah, good. Not because of us, because Jesus is transforming us into his peculiar, bizarre, strange kingdom people. So he continues, he says this, in God's kingdom, we aren't disciples of Fox News or CNN. We are disciples of Jesus Christ, no one else. The kingdom confronts all of us, names our sin. He says, we love our ideology sometimes more than we love the resurrected Christ. And perhaps the sign that we're starting to understand God's whole kingdom is that everyone is offended when they hear it. May we be a winsomely offended offensive church, unable to be categorized, that there'd be this new identity. It's like, listen, no, I'm not here or here. Like, we are following Jesus. There's not some sort of halfway in the middle, like we're not going to take a side. No, we, it's so countercultural. It's so different. Our allegiance is to Jesus. And my friends, that will get you taking shots from both sides, right? The new identity 
he begins to unpack it as well. As we look at verses 21 to 25, Jesus tells us that, okay, not only that, but he says, they will do these things to you on account of my name because they don't know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. So it could read as if, wait a minute, were these people perfect before? And that certainly we know is not the case, right? Like everyone has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. We have the sin nature we were born with. Like we're, we are massively in a bad spot, if not for the grace of God. What this is saying is when Jesus came on the scene and he begins to shine the light, not only shine the light, he is the light. And when we as the church are the city on a hill, when we are a light shining into the darkness, it exposes, it drives out the darkness and the darkness does not want to go. It will put up a fight. Maybe a way to think about it is this, is the exposure though, part of the reason for the opposition is it eliminates excuses. Jesus is saying, listen, I came on the scene and I told you and I was emphatic and I was clear out of love. He came in as the light. This is why John earlier in the book would say this, John chapter three, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. And I can read that. And there can be something within me that's like, yeah, I can't believe those people that love the darkness. And in that moment, the light of the gospel is shining into my heart and saying, you even thinking that for a moment means you love the darkness. There's a self-righteousness that begins to creep in. So this is not just this out there, right? There's opposition in my own heart. There's opposition in the church. Like we are still battling these things. And Jesus loves us enough to shine the light of the gospel. Say, I don't want you living that way. I don't want you living in the dark. One scholar I was reading that this week just likened it to, he said, listen, let's say you, you know, you put up, you've got this mirror in your house, right? And you walk by it and you catch a glimpse of how you look and you're not very happy, let's say, with how, how you look. And so you look at that mirror. You have a couple of choices. Well, you can either try and do something maybe to change your appearance or you can just get rid of every mirror in your house, right? I'm gonna break the mirror, I'm gonna put it out to the trash, I'm gonna do that. Now, if you go that route, that is one way to live, but the reality, it doesn't change you. You still look the same, you're still perceived the same way by other people, but you're kind of like, no, nah, I don't want, you know, I don't want to deal with it. So often that is our disposition. The Holy Spirit is wanting to form us and conform us more into the image and likeness of Christ. The light comes, and we're like roaches scurrying in the kitchen late at night when the light comes on, and they go, is that just my house? Maybe I need to clean, right? I don't know. But that happens, right? Love the darkness. So there is this reality that there's this exposure. And Jesus in his love is saying, hey, like pay attention to that. There's good, godly conviction that the Spirit brings, as we'll look at more closely in just a moment. It's not condemnation. The goal is not to get you to look in the mirror and condemn yourself. No, no, Jesus was condemned in your place. That's been done already. The goal is actually to be, reflect more and more who Christ is, and we can't do that even on our own. That, that's all by God's grace. So as we look, one last thing, I think, in here, 26 to 27, Jesus says this. When the counselor, which is the Holy Spirit, comes, the one I will send to you from the Father... It's the spirit of truth. He will testify about me, all right? But then verse 27 says, you also will testify. And so I think one of the reasons that there's this opposition is that the calling for us as the church, if we think about the mission of being faithful, being fruitful, all of these things, is there is a call, as Peter would talk about, like to give a reason for the hope that you have, to bear witness. That happens sometimes on a Sunday morning with a uh, stage and a microphone, yes. But that is not how it's meant to look most of the time. You're called to bear witness, you're called to testify, I'm called to testify, and I better be testifying not just when I'm up here. Like, that's the call. And we would bear witness. Now, here's what happens, though. Maybe you think about it this way. There's a misunderstanding of mission and merit. When we present to the culture, hey, 
Here's this call, bearing witness about Jesus. For one, it comes off as arrogance. What do you mean? You're saying you have the way, you have the understanding. It can come off, this mission that we're called to can also raise questions about, oh, so the God of the universe loves you. Like, you were lovely enough, you did enough good things, which shows us there's a misunderstanding of merit. Everything in the culture is about merit, right? Not knocking the Boy Scouts, it's a good thing, but the merit badges, like that is just instilled in us. I'm Literally, I'm not knocking that, but my point is this. That mindset can carry on to everything. You have to earn, you have to do, you've got to perform. The problem isn't with merit, it's the focus of us thinking we've got to merit. My behavior is merited death. Jesus is What he has earned, he has merited life. He has lived a sinless life. And then he gives us his life, his righteousness, his holiness. That's what we get. And the world doesn't understand that. And so when they hear you proclaiming, they think, how arrogant, that you would think you could be loved by God, that you've done enough good things. And our opportunity then is to step into, no, 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 you have it all wrong. I don't mean that in a judging, condemning way. Will you hear me out on this? The Bible actually says that God chose the foolish and the weak to shame the wise and the strong. The picture is you on that middle school like playground and they're picking teams, right, for whatever sport and you're wondering, will I get picked because I don't have any skills in this and you're terrible and you're insecure and all of that and that you actually get picked first. You're the first round draft pick and you're awful at the sport. That's the picture throughout the scriptures is God saying, I'm gonna take him, I'm gonna take her. I'm going to pick Jamie. Wait, what? Why? That doesn't make any sense. People begin to understand that. In a sermon, I think it was back in like the early 90s, Tim Keller preached out of some of these verses, and he said this. Let me read this to you, kind of explaining where this opposition can come from. He says, the world thinks if you believe you're right with God, you must think you're perfect. Don't you see how the world has to believe Christians are arrogant? If the world understood it's not the sufficient who are saved, but the ones who finally admit they're insufficient, if it understood that, it would be Christian. The difference between Christians and everybody else is Christians say, it's not what I've achieved. It's the fact that I've been achieved. Christ has come. He has died for me. He has lived for me. He's done everything for me. My faith is provided. I did not choose him. He chose me. He came for me. To understand that, makes you a Christian. To not understand that puts you outside. Therefore, Christians will always seem arrogant because Christians are saying, I know God loves me. I know I'm saved. I know I'm in the family. Therefore, a person from the outside who doesn't understand grace must say, you must be the most arrogant person possible. How could you know such a thing? The world has to think we're arrogant. It can't help it. And I think it is a helpful perspective to just remember and then to remember our opportunity to say, no, no, no. No, you don't, you don't know the half of it. You don't know what God saved me from. You don't know what God has rescued me from. You, you don't know the trajectory that my life would have taken if not for the grace of God. And our calling is not to play into this, right? If you find most of your days like, oh, a lot of persecution, right? And you're like, yep, I'm a jerk for Jesus. That is not the calling right? That is not, you don't get to play that card. Oh, said I'd be persecuted. No, no, no. You're being a moron. Stop it. Cut it out. Repent, all right? That's the call. So if this is what we're going to face, though, to be on this mission, God has not left us. Because if we just read this, like, all right, well, the world's going to hate you. Like, best of luck. Maybe huddle together with a few people just like you that the rest of the world hates and just wait till I come back. But that's not it. Be disciples who make disciples. Share the love of God. Love God. Love neighbor. Move toward people. So how in the world is that going to happen? And so let's look at these few concluding verses because there's this great provision that is made here as we look at verses 5 to 15 of chapter 16. And maybe a way to think about this is, okay, as we're dealing with this, like what hope can we possibly have? But look at these words Jesus says, Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
And this isn't just about some sort of spatial aspect, like Jesus has to like go somewhere where he can't be seen. What he's actually communicating when he talks about going away is like, I've gotta go to the cross, I've gotta die in your place, I've gotta be judged, I've gotta be condemned for the sins of humanity, I've gotta be put into the tomb, I've gotta conquer Satan's sin and death by rising in three days later, then I gotta ascend to the right hand of the Father, then I'm gonna send the spirits. And I'll be ruling and reigning, and the Spirit will be with you. I will, he will be with you wherever you are. So that's what he means when, I'm, when he says, it's for your benefit that I go away. It's not like Jesus just has to move to a different neighborhood. No, he's saying, I've got all this to accomplish. I was reading a study this week. The Gospel Coalition put it out, and it's, it's linked in the, the message uh, notes. But talking about, a, a new study came out talking about People's view of the Holy Spirit, and it's very simple. Do people believe the Holy Spirit is real? And not just people, do Christians. And not just people that identify as Christians, but people that would identify as born-again evangelical Christians, believe that they're sinners saved by the grace of God. Like, getting pretty specific here. And what they found, depending on a couple variables, between 40 to 50% of born-again evangelical Christians do not believe the Holy Spirit is real. Jesus says he's going to provide it. No wonder, at times, the church is impotent. We don't even believe the third member of the Trinity is real. And I get that it raises lots of questions. I don't know what sort of environment you grew up in. If you grew up in the church, maybe you grew up in an environment where there was lots of talk of the Holy Spirit, praying to the Holy Spirit, or maybe you grew up more in an environment like me, which was like Father, Son, and Holy Bible kind of thing, and the Holy Spirit was viewed as like the weird uncle that shows up at Thanksgiving. It's like, I don't know what to do with that dude. Put him at the kid's table. Like, that's usually how that was viewed. So what do we do? But we have to understand the work of the Spirit. But I love what theologian, I want to read this before we look at a couple additional things. J.I. Packer, the late theologian, said it this way in his book on the Holy Spirit. It's called Keep in Step with the Spirit. And he's like, the Spirit can do amazing, mind-blowing, supernatural things. I believe that still happens. There are miracles that still take place. There's miraculous things. I, I do believe that. But if we're walking around thinking that's going to be the norm, that's what it's always going to look like, it would make sense that sometimes, maybe in our context, we're looking and thinking, I don't know if the Holy Spirit's real. Because we only think in the spectacular. But God moves through the ordinary and the mundane. So Packer said it this way, the spirit works through means, through the objective means of grace, namely biblical truth, prayer, fellowship, worship, and the Lord's Supper, and with them through the subjective means of grace, whereby we open ourselves to change, namely thinking, sharing what is in one's heart with others, and weighing any response they make. The spirit shows his power in us, not by constantly interrupting our use of these means with visions and impressions or prophecies, but rather by making these regular means effective to change us for the better and for the wiser as we go along. He can do the spectacular. If the Holy Spirit right now is at work, as the Bible is open, as we're hearing God's word, the Spirit is at work when you came in this morning and maybe you just had a moment to interact with somebody and hear how they're doing. Or when you converse afterwards, you get to know somebody new and you learn something you can be praying for them. When you get connected in community outside of what happens on a Sunday morning, these are average, everyday, ordinary things. But the Spirit is at work. So let's not forget that. So with a few remaining minutes, four things quickly. How can we, like, how should we be thinking about this? I think there's four things that we see in these remaining verses that the Holy Spirit does so that we are not a people without hope. In the midst of the opposition, know this. First, the Holy Spirit brings conviction. We see this, is in, ver this in verses 8 to 9. It says he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then Jesus begins to define it about sin because they do not believe in me. You and I get to proclaim the reality of the gospel. You don't change somebody's life. You don't impart faith to them. Our call is to be faithful. God brings the fruit. And know this, the Holy Spirit will bring conviction. Conviction about what? Ultimately, the ultimate sin is a rejection of Jesus. 
failing to embrace his grace. People wonder, is there an unforgivable sin? What, to, the scriptures speak of like blaspheming of the, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that means when you're convicted of your sin that you don't repent and trust in the grace of God. When you say to God, I want nothing to do with you, I don't want to be in your presence. But what the Spirit does is it brings conviction. You want to know how I know that this plays out again, right? If you're a follower of Christ, I'm a follower of Christ. It means the Holy Spirit brought conviction into my life. When I was an enemy of God, he has made me a friend. That is what has happened. People are, oh, I don't know if I have a dramatic testimony. You are an enemy of the almighty God. He should have killed you, and he made you a friend and invited you around the table. Right? That's pretty miraculous. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. This is what happens at Pentecost. Jesus ascends. He says, wait here in Jerusalem. And then Peter, the one who denied Jesus, the one who was just a colossal failure and mess up, just like the rest of the disciples. Keep that in mind as we're reading this. This is not the all-star A team, right? Peter gets up and preaches. Some 3,000 people get saved. Apparently pretty decent preacher, I guess. I don't know, but in Acts chapter 2, therefore let all the house of Israel, Peter says this, know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when they heard this, they were pierced. They were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. The Holy Spirit makes enemies friends of God. The Holy Spirit preaches to a group of people that had just put Jesus on the cross and says, you can be forgiven. He paid for that sin. They're cut to the heart. It's what happens. But here's what I put before you. I think we are more, I'll, I'll say it this way, I would prefer to be distracted than to be convicted. I prefer distraction to conviction, to just get busy with the things, maybe to give lip service to something or to find something I can busy myself with to not actually pay attention to where the light is shining in the darkness. About a week ago, I was, I was driving, I was making my way back after, I think, picking up my daughter from, from school and making our way back, back home, and uh, I, this car pulled out in front of me. It was a very, very nice car, uh, probably one most of you drive. It was a Bentley. I know most see a lot of those out in the parking lot, right? And so uh, there's this, uh, if you drive, that's no problem. But anyway, um, there is, um, I just want to ride in it later. Anyway, but so uh, th- this car pulled out in front of me, and that, that's whatever, n- no big deal. But then I looked at the, the license plate, um, and it was a custom license plate. Um, and I know I'm making maybe some jumps here, but it, here's what it said on the custom license plate. And I'm like, in therapy. I, that's how I read it, at least, right? And so it just got me thinking. All the while, I'm riding behind this person in the Bentley, hoping I don't rear-end it, right? Because then I'd be in therapy in jail, probably. I don't know. But anyway, um, uh, and there's nothing wrong with therapy, pro-therapy. But to me, it spoke to, man, I don't know if we want to deal with the hard stuff of life. Can I just be distracted by all the candies that this world offers? Can I have the nice car? There's nothing wrong with the nice car, more power to you, that, that's fine. But I wonder if that is so often just an escape for us. Like that's our therapy, that, that's our place of just, I, I don't wanna deal with the real conviction, the real healing. Can, can I just busy myself with this? Or can I acquire this thing? And for most of us here, it probably won't be getting a Bentley, but there's something. And how much are we viewing that as our kind of safe haven rather than saying, no, like the Lord is inviting us to follow him. So the Holy Spirit brings conviction. The Holy Spirit brings clarity. He says this, because about righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. When Jesus speaks of righteousness, he's saying, listen, I'm the righteous one. And this is a shorthand way. One theologian put it this way. When Jesus says, I'm going to the Father, He's literally saying, this is a summation right here of my career. I'm about to give my life for you. I'm about to die a death that you deserve. I'm going to rise again. It brings clarity. Again, how do we know that the Holy Spirit's been doing its work? If you're a follower of Christ, he convicted you of sin. He led you in repentance. He gave you faith. And you have this clarity about Jesus. The Holy Spirit brings clarity. The Holy Spirit also brings comfort, verse 11, and about judgment because the ruler of the world has been judged. Jesus is saying this, and this is so fascinating. He's still a few days away 
from dying and rising again. But he's saying Satan is as good as defeated. This judge, this spirit of this, this world, this ruler of this world has been judged. What looked like victory for the enemy there on the cross became the symbol of our life and our freedom. Otherwise, it's just the weirdest thing in the world that we would put a cross on a, on a wall or on a necklace or anything, an execution device. It is turned into our symbol of hope because Jesus, after the cross, put into the grave, conquered Satan's sin and death by rising again. He is a defeated foe. This brings us comfort. My wife is teaching in Cross Point Kids this morning, but if she was here, she would tell you, I've probably said this before, but if we're watching a, an intense movie, there's some, some scary parts, or there's some things you just don't know how it's gonna resolve, and she's feeling very emotionally involved, and I will look over, and she will have her phone out. Not because she doesn't care, because she's Googling the ending, right? Um, and, and, and I will look over, like, what are you doing? She's like, hey, I wanna be able to enjoy this movie. So she'll find out the end, I'll be like, don't tell me, and she'll, okay, it's fine, but then she will go back to enjoying the, the film. Why? Because she knows how it resolves. Jesus saying, my friends, I want to bring you comfort. There's going to be opposition, but guess what? There's a defeated, vanquished foe. He has conquered Satan, sin, and death. And so the world might malign you, the world might persecute you. Maybe even the world will kill some of you. But you do not fear death because death has been defeated. You just get to meet Jesus sooner. And then the Holy Spirit brings confidence in 12 to 15. Jesus says this, I've got many more things to tell you. You can't bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. There's this confidence that the spirit in the right time is going to continually speak, continually remind you of who you are, of your identity. The spirit will convict you of sin. That's part of God's grace to lead you in repentance. You will at times hear another voice, and it's a voice of condemnation. That is never from the spirit of God. That is straight from the pit of hell. That is the vanquished foe, the enemy's one last grasp, gasping effort to try and say, hey, you, you know, you're, God doesn't love you. You don't belong, right? Has no power. The Spirit will bring conviction of sin to lead us, to guide us, that we might experience this grace. The Holy Spirit brings this sort of confidence. So we'll close with this. Romans chapter 8, this glorious chapter Paul says this, speaking of trials and difficulties and pain and suffering. He says, let me tell you, friends, what it looks like when you're led by the Spirit. Here's the life you're invited into. He says, for all those who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons. And the language there is not to leave women out. It's to say the sons in that culture had the inheritance. So he's saying you all have that identity. You're all sons. You're all, you all get in on this. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but instead you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, then we are also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. When you endure suffering and it will come and maybe persecution and malign, all of these things, you suffer with Christ. It's not to earn anything, but it's part of God's grace to even say, look, like you belong to me. I told you this was going to happen. And the fact that you're still tethered to me is this reminder of the saving work in your life. And the spirit leads us to the throne of God that we can cry out, Abba, Father, that intimacy you belong to God. You're his son. You're his daughter. You are an heir, and he loves to hear God. The Spirit has never gotten called in for a review and said, hey, you need to work on these few things over the next 90 days or it's done. The Spirit has always done its job perfectly, and the Spirit will remind you in your times of need, Jesus is enough. Jesus has paid the way. Jesus loves you. The Father is rejoicing over you with loud singing right now because you have been given the righteousness of Christ. You have merited death, but Jesus has merited life. This is how the Spirit works. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercy, your kindness, your grace. Jesus, we thank you that you ascended, which means that you... You came and accomplished. When you said it was finished, it really was. And that has enabled, it's unlocked this giving of the Spirit. And Spirit, we thank you that you're present here with us. And Holy Spirit, we pray right now that you would be convicting us of sin, that you would lead us into just the joy of repentance. 
as we get ready to prepare to take this meal together, this means of grace, Spirit, nourish us through it. As we sing songs to you, may we celebrate the reality of our new life, our new identity. God, all of us in some ways, we have been beaten down and discouraged by just the reality of life. And I pray today, God, that we leave here as people not puffed up in our own strength or just some sort of self-esteem motivational thing, but rather we would see and we would hear the Spirit reminding us that we belong to you, that we are sons and that we are daughters. For the places when we forget that and we run after other things, God, we repent of that. We thank you that in the midst of trial and difficulty, you, Holy Spirit, apply gospel comfort. We need that. And Spirit, I'm so thankful that you know the needs of each and every person that is here, whether in person or online. I pray that you would speak to them, that you would comfort them, and that you would help them to celebrate the reality of the gospel. And God, would you do this for your glory and our great joy, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.